Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for the goodness that you give to us, for your mercy, Lord God, upon us. Father, we ask you to show us your word today. Give us a picture of Jesus tonight. Give us a picture through the Old Testament scriptures about who Jesus is and how what we learn about him tonight will apply to our life in this day and age. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for helping Steve, for getting him through this heart thing. Lord, you did a great work in him, and we just pray now, Lord God, that you would heal him up 100%. Father, we speak against this gout. that will not have any power or authority over his body and not cause him any more pain. Father, show him your goodness in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for Kay, who also had a heart ablation today. Father, you know exactly where she's at. And I pray, Father God, that you touch her heart and heal her up, Lord God, in amazing ways. And we thank you and we praise you for it in, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, thank you for touching all those in our body. Miss Barbara, who's been having knee problems, help them, Lord God, that they would she would be healed up and all the other folks, Lord God, that are experiencing all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. You sent your word to heal us and we thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. All right, let's get started because we got some good stuff here. Uh, we've been talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, finding him in the Old Testament. And then the book of um, Genesis is one of my favorite places to find him. Because there's so many examples and Genesis gets the whole thing started off and, and there's example after example after example of how God actually got mankind started, how the fall happened, how our recovery was already prophesied thousands of years ago. So let's take a look where we kind of left off last week. Genesis 12, through, uh, 2 and 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now, this is God talking to Abram. He wasn't known as Abraham yet. He was no, still known as Abram at this point in time. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, what an amazing prophecy to give to a man who just shortly before this time was an idol maker and an idol worshiper. But he, he came seeking God. He was willing to leave all of it behind and come and follow God. And, and so here we find him. God says, listen, I'm going to make of you a great nation. This should give everybody, everybody within the, the realm of Christianity and all the folks who are um, kind of just new to Christianity, people who are just jumping into Christianity or people who are just uh, finding out about, about who the Lord is. This should give us all stop to pause because it doesn't matter where you were before. And Jesus talks about that. Jesus talks about it, it doesn't matter. In fact, Jesus says, listen, I didn't come for the well to heal the well. I came to heal the sick. I didn't come for those who were already wealthy. I came for the poor. I didn't come for those who don't have anything. I didn't come for those who were the smartest. I came for those who will accept me, who will lay down their own lives and accept me and receive me. And, and that's exactly what happened in Abraham. So this Abraham is a picture of our salvation. But God adds an extra to him. In that he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Now, we know historically speaking that nations who have, um, who have blessed Israel, who have sent word to Israel, who have paid Israel um, in, in the way of, um, it, it, as far as, not not paying Israel for something, but who who have helped Israel out. Nations like the United States, and through the course of time, before Israel became a nation again in 1948, way back before they were broken up and, and spread all over the world, um, nations that helped them, nations like Babylon, who who actually came to their aid um, and and helped them out. It, it helped them rebuild the temple. That was during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and, and Cyrus 
Cyrus was a great help to him, uh, King Cyrus. And nations who did that ended up blessed. They, they entered into prosperity. They ended up with less sickness, less diseases. They ended up in a time of peace. So we know that the promises of God are true. If you bless Israel, you pray for Israel. In fact, we're, we're told in the New Testament, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If we will pray for Jerusalem, we will end up blessed. That's just the way it is. And, and churches ought to talk about that. People in this country ought to talk about it because we are one of the biggest supporters of the nation of Israel. Now, this is a promise that Yahweh gives to Abram. If Abram chooses to allow God to be his God instead of the idols, God said, I will make you a great nation. Now, verse three is the key to Jesus and Abram's life. All the families of the earth will be blessed in Abram's seed, singular, not seeds, seed. And, and it would be Abram and his wife, Sarai. And, and he said he would bless them and he would make them a great nation. And then they, through, through them, through their seed, they would bless all the nations of the earth. Well, the only way that could be possible was if the Redeemer came through them. So here we see already the prophecy of Jesus coming. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Every nation, every single nation can be blessed through Abraham. Now, let's get to the next verse here. Genesis 12, 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Abram says, I mean, God says to Abram, he tells him, look out over the land. So Abram does. He, he looks out over the land. Um, and, that, and the Lord said, I'm going to give you all that land. And, and it's going to be to your descendants forever. <laughs> He said, to your descendants, I'll give this land. Abram responds by making an altar and sacrificing to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, there is there are some in this day and age um, who would say, well, you know, this is God who came down. No, this is Jesus who came down. Um, this is the same Jesus that spoke to Abram when he first received the word. Um, that he would have a child. If he would allow Yahweh to be his God, he said, I I'll give you a child. If you, if you just allow me to be who I'm supposed to be. Um, he he builds an altar to the Lord, letting us know that he was already willing to sacrifice. He, he knew he, he should offer a blood offering to the Lord. Now, Genesis 13, one through four. Take a look here. This, this you talk about understanding grace. This this one particular set of verses right here helped me understand the choices I make in life. Now, in between this time, Abram goes to Egypt. In Egypt, Abram lies to Pharaoh because Pharaoh is after Sarah, Abram's hot wife. So he. He says, hey, tell everybody you're my sister, tells his wife to lie. She must have really been a looker because she was already, you know, like 80 years old and uh, over 80, actually. And, and Abram says, hey, tell everybody you're my sister, because otherwise they're going to want you and they might kill me to get you. So Abram comes out of Egypt because the the, the uh, pharaoh of Egypt gets, you know, he gets a dream and he says, I'm, I'm not going to mess with your wife. You should have told me, why did you lie to me? He leaves and he becomes exceedingly rich, exceedingly rich. He lies and becomes exceedingly rich. And this is, I mean, it, he does this twice and God increases him. God blesses him in the middle. Now that's not a license for us to go out and lie and cheat and steal and anything else. 
It, it's not. It just shows the power of the grace of God upon Abram. Even when he does wrong, God spares him. God blesses him because he was willing to give up everything to believe God. Now, Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. That's very important. If you have a Bible there, you want to underline this because this, this will help you with choices. To the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So he, he's worshiping the Lord. He's calling upon the name of the Lord. He, he's calling out to Yahweh he, and he's worshiping him. That's what this means. That verse called on the name of the Lord. He's worshiping him. He, he, he wants him to meet with him. So here we find Abram, after lying the king of Egypt about Sarai, being his wife, becoming exceedingly rich. And it even makes sure to tell us that he was rich, what he was rich in. It He wasn't, people say, well, yeah, but he, he just became rich in personality. He just became rich and, you know, as a, as a, he had a rich life. No, he says he became rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. That means rich. That means monetarily rich, not just a rich life. He was rich, not just rich spiritually. He was rich spiritually, or physically as well. Now he pitches his tent between Ai, which means ruin, and Bethel, the house of God. So God's, this is God's MO. God, God's MO from Genesis all the way through the end of the book is to give man a choice. He's always given man a choice. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. You want to uh, eat off any tree of the garden, but don't eat of that tree. He didn't say you you uh, don't eat ever of it, you know, or I'm going to strike you dead before you do. He says, don't eat of that tree, because if you do decide to eat of that tree. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You'll surely die. He gives choices. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He's, God is always giving choices because God wants us to make a choice of our own volition, of our own conscience. God wants us to make a choice for him or to reject him. And it, he doesn't force us to do anything, but instead he gives choices. Now, here we find Abram, he pitches his tent and he's between two places, Ai, which means ruin, or Bethel, which means the house of God. So, so he's got a choice. I can go to ruin, I can go to the house of God. Seems like an easy choice, right? Uh, Ed says God got Abram out of that mess with the king. He does it for us at times when we mess up. He sure does, Ed. That's, that's his mercy. That's his mercy in action. Richard Nice, he changes our dirty diapers. Good. Um, the precedent Abram sets in this in his relationship with God is something that has been disputed for two millennium. One, was Abraham rich? The answer from our text is an absolute indisputable yes. Does God make a habit of blessing those who follow him with wealth? The answer is also yes. Why do we in the modern era struggle with this concept? Why, why do we struggle so much? With if we choose God, God blesses us. Why is it so much of Christianity? Richard, you're right. The love of money does corrupt us. Abraham obviously didn't have a love of money. He had a love of God. And the in the modern era, though, we struggle desperately. The body of Christ struggles desperately with, with being wealthy. We oughtn't, but we do. Um, this is not near as much about wanting or desiring wealth as it is about honoring Yahweh for who he is. 
No, Richard, he didn't follow God to get money. You're absolutely right. You're right, Ed. People don't listen to poor men. A poor man talking about God blessing him is not near as effective as a guy who never went after it, just believed God, and he became rich telling somebody about it. You're right, Richard. The whole point of him following God was he, he wanted a son. He wanted something nobody else could give him, nobody else could promise him. And that was a son. All the idols he had worshipped, they couldn't give him a son. God said, I'll give you a son. In fact, I'll make of you a great nation if you'll just follow me. Now, God, doesn't God speak to all of us that way? Doesn't God speak to us? Um, it, doesn't God speak to the believer and say to the believer, upon our salvation, listen, I'm going to wipe away all the, all the past, all the sins of the past, all the uh, problems of the past. I'm going to wipe all those away, and, and I'm going to help you. I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to make your life better. That's part of why we follow God. God's got a promise that's better than the world. It's better than anything the world could give. Yeah, and Richard, you're right. God, even his wife couldn't give him a, a son. And, and Ed, yeah, he does give our inner man peace. But Abraham had choices to make. When he pitched his tent, he didn't pitch his tent at Bethel. He pitched his tent in between ruin and the house of God. But the natural result of following God is physical blessing. That's the natural result of it. And I know people will argue with you and, and they'll say, well, yeah, but we shouldn't look for wealth or riches. Well, that's not why you follow God. You don't follow God for wealth or riches. The wealth and riches are the natural result of following God. It's a natural result of even the earth works that way. Richard, I, you, I think you're absolutely right. We don't really believe that God will provide for us. I don't, I don't think we really do. I don't think we do. I don't think churches do. That's the reason why most churches are in poverty or they, they, they work Sunday to Sunday. But their people also work Sunday to Sunday. And, and yeah, David and Solomon were incredibly rich. I mean, over the top rich. Elisha was rich. Eli, uh, Elisha and Elijah were rich. Most of the prophets were not lacking in, in uh, personal wealth. All of the kings that followed God were, were exceedingly wealthy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even though they had rough times, they were exceedingly wealthy. If you look at um, Joseph, Joseph left a, a pretty prominent family in their country uh, because his brothers threw him in a hole uh, and gets sold off into slavery. And it's not long. He's running the, he's running the whole kingdom. And, and that's what God does. And you're exactly right. Jesus did tell, tell us that God would open the windows of heaven if we would just seek after him. He also said that, hey, your father who's in heaven, knows that you have need of all these things that the Gentiles seek after. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness, the, the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his right standing, being in right standing with him. Well, there's only one way to do that. And that's Jesus. And that's exactly what God's talking to Abraham about. The natural result of God following or Abraham following God is that he's blessed. Yet all those things will be added to us, Ed. Life changes the minute we give our hearts to the Lord and we, we choose to follow him. Now, we can stand in between, not make decisions. We can we can choose to go to Ai, the place of ruin. Or we can choose to go to Bethel. The house of God. Yeah, Jeremiah 32, 27, great verse. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Yeah, what a great verse. He says it like it is. Look at Genesis 13, 14 through 15. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, 
Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and to your descendants forever. Forever. Lot chooses the best land. Think about this now. Lot looked out because Abraham said to him, Abram had his nephew Lot stand there and he said, hey, look, you see all this? God's given us all of it. You pick, you and your herds. We're not going to fight about where my herds go and your herds go, where my uh, my uh, helpers or my uh, servants take my herds. I'm not, I'm not going to discuss and have a fight about that. We're not going to fight over wells. You pick first. You pick any land you want. He offered him the best land. Lot chooses the best land. But that land happens to go down to this town called Sodom and this town called Gomorrah. So he goes and he, he camps down there. He takes all of his herds down there. He eventually makes his home in Sodom. Abram takes the other land going in the other direction. He says, I'll go that way. Yet it was only in appearance that it, that it was the best land. Uh, and Ed, you know, that's a great point. God never told Abram to, to bring Lot with him. He, he was kind of a tag along, but that's okay. God was okay with that. Um, and, and Lot picked what he thought with his eyes, not what he knew by faith. See, Abraham's operating by faith. Lot's operating by what he sees. It's a major difference. Jesus talks about that in the New Testament. Don't put your faith on what you see. You got to put your faith on what you know. Lot chooses Sodom and Gomorrah. Abram takes the other land. The Lord visits Abram again and makes the promise of the land. Now, the, the Lord does not appear to Lot. He never promises Lot the land forever. Yeah, exactly, Richard. The end, the end for Lot was total destruction. Now, here we have again when it says the Lord said to Abram, the this is again an appearance of Jesus to Abram. We find Jesus making a lot of appearances to bless. In fact, every time he shows up, he's blessing. Look at Deuteronomy 4:33. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? Wow. Apparently, when the voice of God was heard as coming from the throne of heaven, it was always for judgment, according to Hebraisms. That's the, the writings of uh, the rabbis and, and the, uh, the priests. This quote from Moses implies that when God speaks, people die. It's only when Jesus comes to men, either in a pre-incarnate appearance or in a vision, that he speaks with them and they don't die. Gives you the picture between grace, right, with, of grace. Now this goes along with the verse the Lord speaks to Moses saying that no man can see the face of God and live. That's exactly right, Richard. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if Jesus always gives, so does the Father. That's exactly right. But when God's, the, the way the Hebrews thought about this, when they heard the, the voice of God, when they knew God was, was speaking, Look at the verse in Deuteronomy. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and live? Because what their experience was, or what they they recognized, and not saying it's their their assumptions were correct, but saying what they what they were saying, how they understood God. If the voice of God was heard, people were going to die. Now. When Jesus appears to Moses, though, when Jesus appears, though, to Abram, when, when Jesus uh, comes down and talks with different people, 
And, and we see these pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus throughout the Old Testament. Or it says, and God came and spoke to them. Then, listen, there was blessing coming. Jesus was always on the scene to bless. And Jesus was the, he's the picture of who the Father really is. And so when he comes and he, and he speaks as who the Father, because he says, if you see me, you see my Father. When he speaks of who the Father is, he's speaking of the Godhead in these appearances. He's saying, this is, this is really who the Father is. The Father is really the, this blesser. And, and yet, because of the law, because of the, the perception of man about God, they see God as somebody to fear. And sin, instead of somebody to love, is Abram saw him. When God deeds the land of Israel to Abram, it's, a perm, it's permanent and it's final. Genesis 13, 16 through 18, it says, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Jesus once again confirms the promise of children. So he ta he's talking with Abraham. And Abraham obviously recognizes who he is. And he tells Abraham, listen, I want you to walk up and down the length and the breadth of all this land. And, and as you do that, understand, I'm giving this land to you and your children forever as an inheritance. Forever. Then Abram. Remember where his tent was, okay? Abram pitched his tent originally between Ai, ruin, and Bethel, the house of God. How many of us believers do that? We, we pitch our tent, right? We pitch our tent in between ruin and God. We want God, but... Kind of like the way ruin looks sometimes. I mean, think about it, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sounds like he is in a time of decision. God does what God always does. He helps Abram make the decision by prophesying blessing over him if he'll receive it. That's what God does. That's how he speaks to us through Jesus in the New Testament. It's, it's God's modus operandi. Jesus, this, Jesus Christ, the same Yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the same. He's always going to operate in this mode. I'm going to set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. I'm going to set before you ruin in the house of God. Choose which one you want. Well, he helps Abram make the decision by telling him, if you go here, guess what? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all this land. Look at everything I'm showing you. It's, your, it's yours. Just follow me. Lay down everything. Follow me. Get off the fence between ruin and the house of God and follow me. So it says, Abraham moves his tent now to the plain of Mamre. It says he dwelt there, meaning in Hebrew, it's the, the Hebrew word yashab. He sat down. This is a position of rest. What does the New Testament say to us? We covered it a few weeks back when we were talking about Genesis um, Chapter 1, the seventh day, God rested. What does he say to us? Rest. Let me, let me do the work is what God says. Let, let me do the work. Quit trying so hard. Quit trying so hard to be good. Quit trying so hard to be righteous. Quit trying so, so hard to be holy. Just rest. Rest in knowing that you are. Rest in knowing who I am. Rest for God is the place where we no longer work to earn the blessing or the favor of God, we just receive from him. Now, that's not lazy. I mean, we're going to go out and we're going to work hard. We're going to be the best example of work anybody's ever seen. But we're not going to worry about it. We're not going to stress ourselves out whether we get promoted, don't get promoted, have the great job, have a, have a lousy job. We're going to love whatever the Lord puts in front of us because we're resting. 
when you rest, when you're doing something you like, you rest doing it because it's, you like it. And Richard's a uh, an inventor, and um, R- Richard likes to tinker around with stuff, discover new stuff, put together things, and he's incredible. He's he's an incredible genius, and he loves doing it. It isn't like work to him. I think there's times I, I there's times I think Richard, you probably work 24 hours. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? It's fun. Why? Because you're doing what you want. You're doing what you like. You're doing the way, something God created you to do. That's what God says for all of us. Rest in who I am. Quit beating your head against the wall. Trying, trying to do all the time. Relax. Let me take care of it. You just do the best that you know how to do. Have fun with it. Absolutely. Have fun with it. So rest for God is a place where we're no longer working to earn that blessing and that favor. We just receive it from him. The plain in Hebrew is Elon, meaning strong tree, such as an oak. Now, it implies um, and that not and that should have been and. Sorry for the typo. It, it, this implies an oak grove. So Abram moves to this plain of Mamre, but it isn't a plain like it's not an empty place. It's a flat area, but it's. It's a grove of trees. It's pleasant to be in. The sun's not beating down on him. There's plenty of wood to build houses or whatever he needs to do. Now, it says the plains of Mamre. Mamre means strength or fatness. It's a lusty place. But it's a place of strength, a place of wealth, a place of fatness. God doesn't move Abram to a place that he's not going to be able to eat. He's not going to be able to earn. He's not going to be able to do anything. He's not going to be able to build a house or whatever it is that he needs to do. He's not moving Abram to a place. And Abram doesn't go, even though he's he's parked at the time he decides to make the move. He's parked between ruin and the house of God. He moves over to the plain of Mamre, which moves him over closer over to Bethel. It, but it, the place where he goes to is a place of strength. It is, listen, we are our strongest when we're in the presence of God. We're our strongest when we are listening to him, when we're trying to draw close to him. We are, we're not weak when that goes on. We are stronger when we, the closer we get to God, the stronger we get. And also the fatness of the land gives to us. Genesis 14, 14 through 16. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night and he and his. Yeah, and it was kind of an oasis type of thing. You're exactly right. And. So he pursues them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus, Damascus and Syria, right? So he brought back all the goods, and he also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. Of all the verses that we we see in the scriptures, um, this one, I think this scripture speaks of Abram. It, it tells the best where he rose, arose to with God. Because you see, Abram comes out of Ur of the Chaldees, just himself, Sarai, Sarai, and Lot. Lot has a handful of servants as well as a handful, the handful Abram has. Lot gets captured along with his house by the armies of the four kings. Abram, by this time, has 300 male trained servants that were born in his own house. Now, this means his house was very large because these servants had parents and female siblings. It says 300 male trained servants. Well, he wasn't carrying around 300 male trained servants and he didn't have any women around. I can guarantee you that. And and. These servants, the fact that they were born in his own house, it took a set of parents to create the servants, right? 
So we don't know how many people were in Abram's house, but he's got a lot of people. There are a lot of people traveling along here with Abram. So he takes his 300 trained servants. Now, these aren't people who are trained in warfare. These are servants, but they're worshipers. According to the Hebrew Midrashes, which are uh, writings, kind of discussions, um, where they would get together and they would hash through pieces of scripture to, to say what happened, where it happened, how it happened. They would um, connect that with all of the um, things that were said, all the commentaries and, and all the things that had passed down through oral tradition to the different priests and different rabbis. And they would bring them together. They had a midrash where they, where they hacked through this till they got to what the truth was. <coughs> well, according to Hebrew midrashes, the 300 trained male servants that Abram had, what they were trained in was worship. They weren't trained in fighting. These guys are trained in worship and taking care of animals, the flocks, the herds. That's what these guys are trained in. They're, they're not professional soldiers. They're going up against four kings with four armies that had combined together. There was enough that when they came against the five kings who were down the valleys of Sodom and Gomorrah in that area, they captured all of them and took all the people away and took all their stuff. Abram goes up and he defeats the four kings, recovers everything plus spoils without losing a man. He also protects the captured people from Lot's town. So he brings back all the people. He brings back all the spoils of the war. He brings back all the silver, all the gold that those guys had lost with 300 trained servants. Think about how. Yeah, it's an absolute miracle. I mean, we 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 read this story and we go, oh, yeah, well, you know, he went up and captured them. No, this is an absolute miracle. 300 worshipers, herdsmen, worshiping herdsmen, <laughs> they go up against four kings with in a combined army of the four kings that had already been in battle, already been in warfare, already captured cities. Abram goes up, splits his army in half, 150 here, 150 there, how, or however he did it. He split them up. He goes after the other armies, wipes them out, comes back with all the stuff, didn't lose a man, and, and took back all the captives without losing them. Think about that. And I think they, they all knew exactly. Basically, Abram was acting as the priest of that house. He was leading. He was leading. That's what he was doing. He was leading him. He, he led him into battle. And Abram's an old guy at this point in time. He's an old guy. And, and they knew who God was. And they knew. They were convinced. I mean, go to your servants in a house um, and, and ask them to do something that's beyond. Like I, I got a friend of mine who uh, worked for a bunch of people over in Indian Hill doing all kinds of, I mean, all kinds of work for these folks. And uh, they, the houses he worked for, they had servants. People had servants. They had butlers and they had maids and they did work. And I, I asked him one day, I said, well, what do you do if, if these people have gardeners and maids and servants and, and all that kind of thing? They, they, they've got people that are out, you know, butlers and people cooking their meals and all this kind of stuff. I said, what, well, what, what could you do over there? He said, well, they tell the maids and the groundskeepers and stuff that they want a tree cut down or they want the gutters cleaned out or they want the windows washed and they won't do it. So they hire us. They have a fund, a pool of money to be able to hire off the work that they won't do. Now, can you imagine taking 300 people who are basically herdsmen and worshipers and going to them and saying, hey, guys, pick up whatever you have, sickles, swords, pitchforks, whatever it is, uh, you are going to battle with me. Yes, yeah, sticks, you all are going to go to battle with me. We're going to go fight against this trained army of the four kings. Can you imagine what would happen if you, you'd have a rebellion on your hands? 
um, they, they, they're people, they, today's world, they'd be going, no, I'm not doing that. You didn't pay me to do that. You didn't get me, you know, I'm not your servant. So I can go get killed fighting some Kings with their trained armies. Isn't that what people would say? Not these guys. These guys knew Abraham and they knew God. It's not my job description. Amen. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Abram's on his way back, right? He's on his way back. Now, the kings who lived around the area that were afraid of the four kings with their fierce armies wouldn't go out to fight. What'd they do? They went and hid. They hid behind walls. They, they weren't interested in jumping in. So Abram's coming back. The kings go out to meet him. Abram says, hey, guys, appreciate your support there, and keeps going. Then Melchizedek comes out, king of Salem. What does he bring out? Bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. That's Abram gave him, a, gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Now, there's no doubt to any of the commentators that I've read, and, and I read through the different commentaries, um, I mean, some, some big name dudes about this. Nobody says this is anybody but Jesus. Because of all the types and shadows in here and all the absolute appearances, he comes, he's priest to the Most High God. He's the high priest, if you will. He brings out bread and wine. What did Jesus do with his disciples? Broke bread. Just what Melchizedek did. Broke bread, gave them to eat, and then gave them wine. And then he blessed them. How does he bless them? He blesses them in the name of the Lord. Exactly what Jesus did. This is an exact replica of what Jesus does with his disciples. And, he, and then Abraham responds back by giving him a tithe of all. This is profound because Jesus appears as who he is. This is the first time that we see this in the Old Testament. We don't really see it again, actually, until we see Jesus as the resurrected king sitting on the throne of his father. Crowned by his father in the heavens. We don't really see who Abram is. I mean, who Jesus is. From this point in, until the next time we see him. At the, at the end, book of Revelation really describes Jesus, who he really is. I, I guess you could say what Isaiah's description of the heavens, you, you could see who he was. Yet, yeah, Richard, exactly. He was the secret Messiah. That's exactly who he was. But this is profound that Jesus comes to, to Abram here. And, and think about the connection. We talk about Abram being the father of faith. Think of the connection here between Abram and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. God Most High possesses heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High. But he blesses Abram with the blessing of God Most High. Jesus blesses us as believers with the same blessing he blessed Abram with. In fact, the New Testament says the promise of Abraham was given to his heirs, and it calls us the heirs. And it says we're blessed with the, with the same blessing that Abram was blessed with, we're blessed with. And he says, God's delivered your enemies in your hands. Think about that. Now. <clears throat> Richard said, the promise of Jesus, God, is yes and amen. Absolutely. It, it's, it, it's not the first time Jesus came to Abram, 
But it was the first time that Jesus came to Abram, revealed for who he really is. The priest, the high priest of God Most High. And, and, he, and he appears to him as a king. Remember who comes out, king of Salem, right? It, it says, um, well, let me, let me just cover a couple of verses here. In Psalm 110, Psalm of David, here's the Lord's proclamation to my Lord. Sit down at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And the Lord makes his promise, this promise, an oath and will not revoke it. You are an eternal priest after the pattern of Melchizedek. Is what it says about, about Jesus. He's a priest after the pattern or the order of Melchizedek. In this Psalm of David, we see reference to this eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. Direct connection. There's a clear reference to Jesus as he's the, he's the Messiah. So this is a clear reference to the Messiah, right? This is a clear reference to Jesus as he is the only one that enemies being placed under his feet is spoken to. He's the only, he's also the only one that is told to sit at God's right hand. Nobody else is told to sit at God's right hand. It says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. But the one that got the invitation to come and sit at the right hand of God, where he was uh, had a coronation to be the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings, is Jesus. And so, yes, Jesus is Melchizedek. Now, take a look here at Hebrews 5, 5 through 6, out of the Net Bible. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming high priest, but the one who glorified him was God. So the one who, who the one who placed Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, in the place of being high priest, is God. He said to him, "You are my son. Today I have fathered you." When he coronated him, made him the high priest, he said, "Today I have fathered you." It's also in another place God says, "You are a priest forever." In the order of Melchizedek. Here we find again Jesus being directly equated to Melchizedek as high priest. In Hebrews 5, 9 through 10, it says, And by being perfected in this way, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And he was designated by God as high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was perfected. By submitting himself to the wrath of God, Jesus became perfected in that way as a man. And he became the eternal source of salvation to all who would obey him. This totally opens the door, as Richard just said, totally opens the door for us to go directly to God. No longer do we as human beings have to go to a priest here on the earth? We don't have to go to a priest to talk to God. We can talk directly to God. We can make direct uh, requests from God. We can speak to God uh, his own word. And it says he was designated by God as high priest, not just a priest, high priest in the order of Melchizedek. When we get back to the book of Leviticus, we're going to talk about the role of the high priest and, and how that connects to Jesus. Because, because, yeah, Richard, right, there was only one. There was only one high priest at the time. That there, there wasn't a high priest and another high priest and another high priest. There was a bunch of priests, but there was one high priest. Jesus is the one and the only one. Now, in Hebrews 7, 1 through 2, it says this. Now, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, look at the titles, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. That could correctly, be, because he says priest of the most high God, that could be correctly uh, interpreted as high priest of the most of the most God. Let's, we can just say that priest of the most God. Amanda, thanks for joining us tonight. Get those kiddos in bed. So he, he, 
he met Abraham when he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. Remember who Jesus is, King of kings, Lord of lords. To him also Abram apportioned a tithe of everything. His name first means king of righteousness, then king of Salem, that is, king of peace. And, and who is Jesus? The prince of peace. Who, is, who was he first? King of righteousness. That's who Jesus is. Our righteousness. And he's the king of peace. Nowhere else in scripture does it, does it state so clearly that this Melchizedek is indeed Christ. He has the power to bless from the hand of God. His name is King of Righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one, except for Jesus. He is also the Prince of Peace, or King of Peace, as it says here in, in Hebrews. All titles relating to Jesus, not to a man, not to anybody else. All these relate to Jesus. Now, in Genesis 14, 21 through 23, it says this. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and take the possessions for yourselves. But Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord, the most high God, creator of heaven and earth, and vow that I will take nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal. That way you can never say, it is I who made Abram rich. This is a picture of Jesus with Lucifer at the top of the temple. The parallels are right there. Uh, believe me, I, I kind of freaked myself out. I was like, whoa, this is this is exactly what happened to Jesus. And and we see here a type of Christ in, in what Abram, what happens with Abram. He showed Lucifer showed Jesus all the riches of the world. He says, you just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all this. And Jesus' response is the same as Abraham's. Listen, nobody's going to say they made me rich. Nobody. I don't answer to you. I don't answer to you. I answer to God. His word makes me rich. It is God alone who provides my wealth. This is exactly what Abraham said. And that's what Jesus told the devil. Now, our, our last verse for tonight. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, this is a, clearly a vision and not a physical appearance because it says plainly. If, if God gives a vision, he plainly says in scriptures, there are appearances of Jesus. Like when it says Jesus came down and talked with him. Or later on, we're going to see Jesus appears to him again. And to fulfill the promise. When it says it's a vision, it's a vision. When it says otherwise, it's not. It's it's God showing up in the form of Jesus. And it's it's not a physical appearance. It's something that it's a vision that Abraham's seen. Hebrews 10 35, it says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Paul is speaking of persecutions. And tells the church to not cast away their confidence. Their confidence has a great reward. This is what the Lord told Abram in the vision. Don't fear. Jesus is our great reward. That's exactly what he said here. Yeah, Richard, if, if only we could believe that. He's our exceedingly great reward. That means overflowing, overwhelming. I mean, gushing great reward. And that's exactly what it says in, in Hebrews. Great reward. And, and the, by the way, Richard, the, the term in, he, in Greek, great reward, do not cast away your confidence. It has great reward. That great reward is equivalent to the exceeding great reward that in Hebrew. Yeah, more than just making the bills every month. It means overflowing, overwhelming. You see the parallels? All the way through scripture of how God deals with Abram, he deals with us the same way. We're there. We are that seed at the end. We're that seed that is going to bless the world through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope that you got something out of this. 
Um, Pamela, good night. Listen, Jennifer, have a great night. Everybody else that's online, Barb, uh, Joyce, Richard, y'all have great nights. Be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Have a great, great night.